Hello everyone, this is Historic Sodderly. I'm Jeannie. Welcome to episode four of The Big Picture. Um, today I, I'm going to talk about how the exterior of the house has evolved and what that means to the landscape. As you can see, the weather is not cooperating today. It's totally raining, so I'll do the best I can. I am here on the river side of the house on the portico right now and I will change my orientation so that you're not seeing everything backwards. So a little challenge uh, today, but we're going to do it. So uh, thanks for joining me. Um, the, uh, you, you're welcome to go in and out of the, of the uh, program. It's going to be recorded so you can go back later if you miss anything. Uh, Catherine and uh, Jane, hi Angela, hi Nancy. Um, Nancy and and Jane and Catherine will be helping. I mean, uh, I'm sorry. Jane and Catherine will be helping you with our digital resources and answering back and forth. You're welcome to comment. You're welcome to uh, talk to each other. Uh, I won't always see your name pop up, so th that's up to Jane and Catherine to respond to you. Um, I have provided some digital resources for you that Catherine will, uh, will give you. First of all, it's Digital Maryland. One suggestion I'm going to make when I talk about this today is look at some old pictures of Soderley in the house and how it's evolved. These are free resources. Digital Maryland, there is a um, we have a, a, a partnership with St. Mary's College of Maryland, and so a lot of our pictures, especially of the house and landscape, are put up there. Um, so that's one they will provide. And another link is Maryland Historical Trust 2004. Uh, it is an archaeological survey that includes uh, facts about the house, and, but keep in mind that 2004, that is old. So um, you want to, uh, before you write a book, don't use this, okay? Call us and let us give you the most recent research and information. Uh, there's nice photos in this though, and it, it is a survey. A new survey has been done, a recent one, and we're waiting for the final report to come out. So that should be soon, and we'll make sure and share that with you. So, welcome, and um, what I want to do, I'm going to change my camera orientation so you're not looking at things in a mirror image, and everybody's saying, why is the slave cabin on the wrong side of the road, okay? So, um, here you go. I'm going to switch. Okay? So, now I don't really see you, so, because um, I am going to point it to the house. And you're not going to see my face all the time. So it is still raining, but I'm going to step out here just a minute. Oops. Okay, there you go. So uh, this, is, this is the front door, of course. And you see uh, the portico. We call this the riverside. There's a reason for that. Because the orientation of the house has changed... Um, over the centuries. So in the 18th century, the river side of the house was the front of the house. Okay, because we're on the river side. In the 19, by the 19th century, the orientation of the house, they considered the roadside the front. So uh, we, um, we say Riverside, roadside, so we know what we're talking about. If you say front door, back door, you know, which front door, which, so it's very, uh, it's very confusing. So, um, so here you go. So that's the portico. Now, it didn't always look like this. You might want to get out some of the resources. I hope they're shared to you already uh, when they are, and you can kind of see the evolution of this house. This portico did not always look like this. So back in James Bowles' time, about 1703, remember he had a hall and chamber house. Uh, it would be, the house would have gone, let me drag my plug in here. The house would have gone, 
the house would have started about here to this window. You see there's to count two windows and this, this window here. So that would have started the um, one, two, three, the third window. So this, you can see my reflection. See, I'm not a ghost. It's me, see it? So, uh, we, um, this would have been the bull's house where it started, the hall of the bull's house here. Um, there would have been some kind of a front door, but you would have walked straight in. It wouldn't open to a staircase like it does now. It would have opened up into the large hall, the chamber. So all of this front door was redone sometime in the uh, late 18th century. And the Chinese Chippendale staircase that you've seen before, um, that wasn't there in the James Bowles era, right? So you would just have a, you would have a story and a half of two rooms, basically. And then anything else you needed would be um, out a side, like a, the kitchens and things and the, the buildings. So this is, this is the red room. So in the 1729 inventory, it's called the uh, Madame Bull's bedchamber. So this is also part of the 1703 house. So it would go from the, uh, basically the end of the red room to the second window on that side would be about the size of it. And then it would not go to a whole two stories. It would be a half story with chambers at the top. So James Bowles, uh, he did add a room, but it's on the road side. And we'll look at that in a minute, hopefully. Um, if, if I can get over there with some power. Uh, so he did add the, what we call the new room or Herbert Saddley called it the library, and we'll look at that on the other side uh, in a little bit. And then about 1730, we have the dining room added. That was under, um, that was right, uh, probably right uh, at the end or during George Plater II's tenure. So he would have created a dining room. This used to be a passage that went, a passage was just like, it's kind of like a breezeway, only it's closed up like a hallway, but it would, it would be a utility space where you could pass from the dining room and uh, to the living spaces. So th that, that door, there was a, a breezeway that went straight on to the roadside. So you could go from the riverside to the roadside through here. So who is sleeping in there and who is using these spaces, okay? Uh, you can think about that. Um, and then uh, the dining room. And uh, we think at that time there was a detached kitchen somewhere. Um, it might be over here, there, it might be over there. We're not quite sure where it was. We're missing some of our buildings from uh, that far back. So that uh, someday maybe we'll have it marked where we know where things are. So on the portico then, um, at about 1803, and the reason I know it's 18, about 1803 is because it's, it's actually on a land document compiled by Pete Himmelhaber. And he does uh, things where uh, the land and the, uh, and he, it happened, uh, wills, and he happens to mention that in 1803 there was a kitchen. So this was an attached kitchen, not a detached kitchen. It did have a breezeway too. So if you're looking at some of the old pictures on the resources I gave you, you can see before this was changed, there was a big, um, there was a big uh, two-story uh, kitchen over here with a breezeway that went by the wall into the dining room, right? But it stuck out way over here. You see where those bushes are and that light fixture is. If you see that, I'm looking toward the slave cabin, but it was, it was a big attached kitchen. And we, 
we call that the Briscoe Kitchen, but about 1803 really is when it was added on. So that was even before the Briscoe time. Uh, so where is it? So there was a big pump at the end. You can see pictures in some of the resources. There was a big pump at the end. There was, um, you can see when Herbert Sadley bought the house in 1910, you've got, I've got pit, we've got pictures of him before he changed the house and tore the Briscoe kitchen down, the 1803 kitchen. So it went, it was a big thing. Um, and there was a scullery kind of porch on the, uh, on the other side of it, where, um, according to Agnes Kane Callum's um, oral history and tradition, uh, that's where enslaved would get their rations every week, pick them up. So um, this here, in 1910, when Herbert, if you see this big, um, I'm trying to see your view here and drag my extension cord. Okay. So so if you see this, I'm standing if some, I'm standing right here on the portico. I'm right at the end, correct? And there's the door to the what's that we call the larder, the back door. So, uh, so you see that big holly tree there, and you see the light fixture there. So that's about as big as it went. So you have to imagine this other kitchen was not here. Um, in 1910, there was a, a a slave quarter right out here where this holly tree was, okay? It, it was one of the first things that Herbert Satterley tore down. It looked just like our slave cabin, only had a little attachment to it, and I think you can see a chicken coop or something next to it in one of the pictures. It has a stone foundation, which that's the way foundation that used to be on our existing slave cabin, but it, when it was restored, they did concrete but it used to be those stones, and we're thinking that it was the natural stone that was found here on the shores of the Chesapeake, I mean, the Patuxent, um, on both sides of the Patuxent from here. So it used to be right here. So look at some old pictures, and that is in, in the collection, that slave cabin. Uh, so if you were standing on the roadside you would be, you could see straight through to that slave cabin that used to be there. Remember this kitchen over here that we have now is not that old, okay? So basically this door, and I like to, when I'm inside, I'm sorry, I'm dragging my stuff. On the, um, this door is the door to the larder. So if you've ever been on a tour uh, this is usually where the tours, the regular tours, uh, come out of the house onto the portico. Um, so this is this is the door uh, that goes into the larder area and the back stair. Um, so I like to imagine that you know when in during the Civil War you would step out of the house and you would you would be in the in the kitchen. You'd be out of the house on the scullery area already. Um, so this this area here, you can see how some of the the stone, uh, how the stone is different where the Briscoe kitchen, excuse me, used to be. You can see how different it is. Do you see how different? Can everybody see that? And on the other side, it's like that too. So it tells you a little bit about how big this kitchen was. Here's where the stone changes again. So these almost look like, you know, uh, poured concrete kind of stone replicas and these look different, but you can see the line. So you can see where the 1803 kitchen was. And that 1803 kitchen was uh, connected to the upstairs of the house. By then it's a full two stories. And um, so you have enslaved who's living upstairs in the kitchen and going in and out back there in the house. Well, uh, the people that are serving the house, uh, the enslaved are, families are sleeping upstairs in the kitchen. So whoever works in the kitchen, remember you, you, um, you sleep usually closest to where you work if you can. So people that are living 
uh, their quarters or their living spaces are, you know, they're serving the house, they're near where they work. So in 1917 though, um, 1910 is when Herbert Sadley bought the place, but in 1917, it was a big uh, renovation. It's not raining quite as much. I'm gonna try to get out here. Um, so it was a big renovation. So the larder was covered up, all the roof lines are even, and that the kitchen was removed, and a new um, colonial style kitchen was added onto the end. Of course, you can still see the 19th century um, uh, meat house or smokehouse. So that all happened to look like this in 1917. Uh, it wasn't this big wide white paneling. Uh, it, so look at some of these old pictures when you can still see the Briscoe, the 1803 kitchen sticking out. Looks totally different, okay? You can see that, that uh, that's at the end of the garden, the flagpole and all that. So that are, give us some orientation, you can see down here. So why is this the only slave cabin we have left? We're, there were several left, not in a row, but there were several left duplexes and singles. So why is that the only one left? Well, there's probably a couple of reasons. Um, because there were people still living in it, as we talked about last week, Nanny Williams and her grandchildren were still living in it in 1910. Another reason though, you see how it's kind of tucked away. It's not really, it's behind the trees there and it's not obstructing any views. So that's probably the main reason that, um, uh, you know, Herbert Sadley is trying to recreate a romanticized view of what colonial life was like and uh, during, you know, right before the revolution. So, he doesn't want a bunch of old slave cabins right here by the house, right? He does, He wants nice, beautiful views, you know, like a gentleman's house would be. So that's what, the, what he's trying to do. But probably it's just a matter of a lot of different things happen to make that the one that's saved for some reason. But um, those are some two, two main reasons, I think. It wasn't, it didn't block any views. It was over here at the side. Uh, basically, that used to be part of Old Wharf Road anyway. So, um, you think about that. You don't think about that one now because it's all quiet, but there's probably traffic going by that slave cabin down there at, at some point. So, um, that's something to think about, too. Um, so, you can see, of course, that's that's the tuck scent. Um, I'll try to see. You can see the water the Patuxent, it's really foggy, but you can see it. The birds are singing today, yay. So, I'm gonna pick up my, my core and try to get out here a little bit. Just so you can see. Okay, here we go. So here, here we go. That's the house. So, oh, the cupola. The cupola was, there was a cupola on the house, uh, but Herbert Sadley, um, it, it has been restored and it has 1729 because that's when George Plater II married Rebecca Bowles, widow Rebecca Bowles. So he's trying to remember the Plater period, so that's why. So you can see the smokehouse, but try to imagine right out here, you have oops you have um you have a you know the um a slave cabin right out here uh by this holly tree so the how 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 much more um you know busy noisy animals you know right now the birds are singing and it's, all you can hear is the rain and everything but um it, it used to be, uh, you know, smell different, look different, 
So we kind of have to imagine that now. Okay, I wanna, don't want to electrocute myself here. Okay. Okay. So um, that's the, that's the, uh, what is it now? It's not the front or the back. This is the riverside, right? We say riverside, roadside. So one other um, thing about this is if this is the front of the house, why is that slave cabin down there? Well, it was the, remember it was the front of the house in the 18th century. That slave cabin was built in the 19th century. So by the 19th century, the orientation of the house had changed. So it makes perfect sense by then that was the, where the slave cabin is now is uh, the back of the house. So that makes sense now. So yes, really hard. And of course, uh, by the 19th century, tobacco is really not uh, grown as much, but the main crops are cereal grains like corn, wheat, and that kind of thing. So there you go. So I'm gonna try to, let me see, if my battery holds up, I'm gonna try to walk this way. They tell me this cord is gonna go far, but we'll see. Okay. So I'm walking around the house and here is the smoke house and I'm gonna stand I'm on the porch of the kitchen now. And you can hear some beeping going on, so I'm in the right place. <laughs> All right. All right, sorry if I got drops of water on you, but I'm afraid to wipe my, wipe my, um. <laughs> All right. Wipe my phone. I'm afraid I'll get rid of it. So that's a smokehouse. So that's a, that's a 19th century structure. Um, most of the time there is the meat. They call it a meat house. They can call it a smokehouse. But they were still smoking turkeys and hams well into the 1980s here um, and selling them. Uh, there's still some smokehouse equipment in there. There's some signage. Uh, make sure you look at signage around the house. Um, make sure you look at the signage um, when you go around the house because you get more information. So you can do a good tour of the outside just fine. The spinning cottage, you know that little cottage that sits by the, uh, the house? Well, that was uh, pretty much uh, put there by Mabel Satterley Ingalls. So she used that, she used everything that wasn't, um, had a roof on it and a bathroom as guest housing because she invited a lot of people um, uh, to come. They, were, they could come and stay, they rented out property and evidently she had a hierarchy. If she knew you well and you were uh, really good friends. You got to stay in the manor house, and then, as you know, your your pecking order. Then you were put in the slit in the spinning cottage, and then you might be out in the gate houses or whatever. There was another guest room that right now serves as our archives above the kitchen. So, um, so this porch um actually was during hurricane irene was actually one of one of the few things and we we were very fortunate but that got a tree on top of it and had to be restored so this has been restored just lately uh also the smokehouse had to be restored after hurricane irene the, the smokehouse roof got it but we were i can't tell you um there's something taking care of Soderley because all these huge trees fell all over the, around the house and other buildings and didn't bother it. So, um, so there you go. So this, this is the 
19, what year? 1917 kitchen. Uh, right now, uh, we use it uh, for uh, kind of a staging area and a place where we put stuff. Uh, there's a bathroom in there for docents and things. Uh, but it's not open to, on, on, to the public on a regular tour. When I do a backstairs, upstairs, or an insider tour, I, you know, people like to go places they don't ever get to go. So I take them through the kitchen. You know, it's not a big deal to me, but um, it is what it is. So, uh, but it's, it's really cool. Um, there's a lot of stories. Donald Barber, if you ask him some stories about this kitchen, he actually grew up in this kitchen, he says, and his first memory was staring at the roof. He, he remembers it as a, a good time in this kitchen where all the workers and his mother and family members and all the people that worked at Sodery at that time in the, in the 20th century, mid 20th century would gather. So he, he has fond memories of this space. But at first it had, you know, it did have a fireplace. It had an old black stove at one time. And uh, now it has some, uh, I would say 1950s style appliances in it that we don't use that much. But um, uh, I guess the health department at one time in the early museum, um, you know, kind of was threatening them to shut their jelly making down or something. That was the story I heard. And so somebody tried to make it into a commercial kitchen. And oh, like, like a lot of things that Soderly um, didn't quite get there. <laughs> so someday my dream is to um, interpret this space as a, a 1917 kitchen again. Uh, I would love that. Uh, that would take some work and money. But um, yeah, preservation is expensive, folks. Uh, people do ask that question. They ask, um, why, uh, why can't Soderly uh, change the house back to the 18th century? Well, that's a good question, and we get asked that a lot. Why can't you take it back to George Plato the uh, third period, and why can't you take it back to this and that, or the Briscoe period? Well, there's lots of reasons. Mainly, it's up to our board of trustees to uh, agree and our interpretation uh, and preservation uh, uh, committees and our experts that we consult to decide what's best. So uh, uh, it would take to take this house back to the 18th century, just the time of the revolution. Um, you would have it would be a major overhaul some of these spaces don't exist anymore like this kitchen would have to go right um that smokehouse would have to go it wasn't here in the 18th century um so what what the uh powers that be uh that make these decisions and you know it's a lot of people it's not just one person um decide that you know slaughterly is 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 unique in that it's not like uh, Monticello or Mount Vernon where, you know, after 1799, they throw everything away because that's all they interpret is the life of um, George Washington. Uh, it's not like that for us. We have continuous owners. Uh, there's lots of stories through the centuries. Uh, the house morphed and changed. Our collections also are mainly from later periods. So we, if we wanted to go totally back to the 18th century, we wouldn't have much furniture. Um, so, um, so that is, um, that is why. Uh, we just had a big meeting, you know, because we were restoring, trying to restore some interiors and the question was, do we keep Mabel's wallpaper because it was in bad shape? You know, do, what do we want to do? Um, there's just a, a difference of opinion sometimes. Some people uh, are absolutely can't stand Mabel's taste and what Mabel did to the house. And other people, I mean, um, you can't discount what Mabel did. Uh, her style and her taste is also important. 
Uh, but it's just it's just really a matter of dollars and cents a lot of times. And when you have a, a project going on, either through a grant or through a, a generous donor, um, to get these things done, because preservation is an expensive proposition. Um, so here here's a good view. I love this I love this view, and I like to imagine, you know, the this is. This is a building that was put here by Mabel. They decided they needed bathrooms, public bathrooms, so, and it used to be the gift shop. We call it uh, what the, the Customs House is the, is the museum name. So you can see down to the rolling road. And you can see everything is blooming. So I am going to um, try to get my core to go on the other side of the house. We'll see. Okay, here we go. I think this is the, probably the best I'm gonna be able to do today. Um, so this, uh, this of course is the kitchen and the dining room that was about 1730. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a butler's pantry kind of building. Um, the dining room and this structure that sticks out here, that is the uh, first addition to the Bowl, Bowles Hall and Chamber. That's the new room I was talking about. So that, look, to, look at the old pictures because that is not really how it looked on the outside when Herbert Satterley bought the house. So make sure you look at some of these old pictures. Um, the brick, there was no brick, no brick on Satterley's house until Herbert Satterley put it there, okay? This was not a, never a brick house. This is a Flemish bond, but uh, of course his interpretation of what he wanted the house to be had brick on it, right? And some of the dormers he put on, he, he um, put concrete for the foundations and places because really by the time he bought it in 1910, it was about to fall down. I mean, it was really in bad shape. So even though his interpretation was romanticized, I mean, he's part of the reason. Here's my air traffic, you hear it? Um, so it was romanticized. Um, it wouldn't be here if he hadn't sunk all, you know, come along and he had a lot of money, so he's sinking it into the house. So, um, I mean, a lot of people may fault him for that, but I mean, it's the, it's, it's what it was. There's nothing, um, you know, he's not interested in keeping a house with a slave cabin right in the back and, you know, all that. He wants, um, uh, he wants Mount Vernon, that's what he wants. And so you notice when you look at the portico, uh, that's really where he's going with that. So one of the stories that uh, we have is in the old museum, and you'll, you can find it online anywhere. You can find all this old stuff online, it never dies. So uh, you know the phrase that Soderley is older than Mount Vernon? Well, that is true, that is totally true, it is. Our house, Soderley, is older than Mount Vernon. In fact, George Peter III and George Washington were about the same age, just a few years apart. So yeah, this was, this Soderley was here. It wasn't called Soderley until the Platers owned it, but it was here way before Mount Vernon. But uh, there's a, there's a legends and lore that George Washington uh, saw Soderley and he made his house at Mount Vernon to look like Soderley's. Well, that part is not true. Um, there's no evidence that George Washington ever was here for one thing. And um, it wasn't that George Washington copied Soderley. It was that Herbert Soderley copied, copied Mount Vernon. That was the deal. So it's kind of starting to rain a little bit more now. So I'm going to step back on here. And you see, uh, there's more signage. Make sure you see when you come by, uh, sometimes don't pass up the signage. It's really good. Um, it's, it's just been redone in the past, you know, four or five years. It's pretty up to date. So make sure you, you can get a good tour just by the signage and our markers. Uh, one of my episodes, I, when, it, when I can, absolutely can, when the weather is, promises to be nice, I'll do a sign tour for you. Uh, those are always cool. I love to do that because I like to read the signs myself sometimes. I like to go by. That's the Grape Arbor. 
out there. Do you see it? Uh, let's see. It's hard for me to see what you're seeing. But there's the grape arbor, do you see? Okay. And you see there's the, the, there's the rose arbor. That was put in by Herbert Sadley, all this fencing. It's been restored, of course, but. Um, so the rose arbor was another thing that was there that got just totally destroyed by Hurricane Irene and it was replaced. So that's all, all the garden, it's a colonial revival garden. So uh, we keep it the way Herbert Sadley and Mabel Ingalls did. Uh, when, if you look at old pictures of the house, when you go on these resources and look at all these old pictures, um, you are going to um, see how that space really looked. It was like a basic farm garden. It had a strawberry patch. They grew, you know, they just grew vegetables and there was no brick wall uh, that was added by Herbert Satterley. There was no, that's a matching little gatehouse, I mean, um, uh, like we call it the tool shed, but it matches the necessary that was put in by Herbert Satterley. So Herbert Satterley likes symmetry and clean lines. He didn't like it messy. So that's what we had. You can see that's our office and you can see the, the, the spaces here. So I, I don't think there's anything I really left out. I, I just couldn't, um, you know, move back and show you some of the views that I really wanted to. But maybe I, I'm going to unplug myself here right now and see if I have enough power to, uh, to go out here and just show you this, this side of the house. Here we go. I got my raincoat on. I'm not worried about my hair. So, all right. So hopefully you don't have to look through raindrops, but that's the way it is. Um, okay, we're doing something different over here. This is you see all that that we're doing. We're trying to do something different over there. So you can see. Okay, now you can see it. So let me try to even move back. So you can see the gatehouses, the gatehouses, and you can see. Okay, see the brick. You know those windows, I call them Amityville Horror uh, Movie uh, windows. There's a name for them, but it escapes me right now. Those weren't there. That brick was not there. We have a lot of plaques. I see that we have moved our plaques because they're, they're kind of rethinking some of this stuff. Um, so here we have, this makes sense because it, this is our this is now, it used to be out there in the bushes, but now it's our Sodderly His National Historic Landmark sign that's right here by the house, which makes so much more sense, don't you think? Tell me if you like it or not, because now you can actually read it. You know what it is, right? And then um, here is uh, an award that Mabel Sodderly Ingalls got from the the for her educational uh, programming. There you go. 1990. She died in 1993, and uh, a landmark in 2000. Now, just because you're a landmark doesn't mean they give you money. Just so you know, people think you get money for some of these, and you're really protected. But no, you're not. It takes it takes people to protect things. So, and I want to walk around here. This is a little, this is, this is the garden. This is working out. I like this. So see how pretty that is? Oh my word, it's so pretty. Just listening to the rain. It's kind of peaceful here. See? Pretty, you can hear the birds. Nice. Uh, I do have some pic a picture of that, that um, sundial. It's been replaced and restored a couple times, but it, I have pictures of it. And there's, there was one there uh, uh, at 1910, I know, but it wasn't that one, but it was one. You can see there's a turkey shed back in there. You see the turkey shed? So that, that was moved from the farm area over there by the knot house, the visitor center over here at one point 
and so um, the environmental ed kids, like the uh, second graders, use that for education. So that used to be part of the farm system that was over by the visitor center. Used to be in, by the knot house. I wanted to show you this. So this is uh, an, a plaque from, I think it's, uh, Daughters of the American Revolution to George Player the Third. Okay. Um, and Dar has uh, tried to do a, a. They're doing a much better job of inclusion, and uh, I think uh, any. There's a lot of uh, people that are ancestors, uh, descendants of, of people that uh, fought in the Revolutionary War and that contributed to the war effort. So it's becoming much easier because some of these elite groups, you know, that were founded basically for, you know, European descent people, white people, uh, to, to be really um, elite, uh, are learning that they can't survive like that. You can't be elite forever and survive. You have to have people to help help you. So... Um, you know they're getting with the program. They're do Dara's doing a wonderful job. Um, other organizations like that are doing better than others. But hey, you know, live and learn, right? It improves. Okay, so this is the other side of the. You, s you might see my reflection. It's not a ghost. That's me. I should have people show me all the time these pictures with reflections in them, and they tell they seen a seen a ghost. You know, I could I could do this and do the same thing, right? But yeah, so they're seeing their self in the uh, in the in the window. So this is the other side of the new room or the library, uh, the 1715 room that uh, James Bowles put on. So um, uh, in a couple weeks, hopefully, uh, we'll go inside the house and do some things. Um, it, it's gone through some restoration in, in the past year, so things aren't uh, quite in the places they need to be, so we'll have to work on that. Catherine's going to help me, and we're going to get that in shape. So we can at least do some digital inside tours until the pandemic has calmed down. So I hope you all are well and safe. Um, it is nice to get outside, so Sodaly's grounds are open every day. Uh, 10 to 4, 12 to 4 on Sunday, and you're welcome to come and enjoy the outdoors using social distancing. Um, remember us when you have a few extra bucks, uh, we could always use it. Um, and thank you for all the supporters and the viewers out there. And um, I think I'm going to sign off. Make sure you look at your resources, and if you need to. Um, if you need to go back to the video, it'll be recorded, okay? Thank you very much. And I'll see you next week at 2 o'clock, next Thursday.